Greetings. In this letter, signed as Candidus, I speak strongly about liberty and take you through some of the ancient history that was well understood in my day. What I say very nearly identifies with what you are experiencing in the 21st century. Sadly, modern Americans have no real understanding of liberty. It is not taught in your schools or your churches as we founders understood it and expected the concept to be perpetuated through time. The study of the ancients no longer touches your thoughts in a manner that would have you understanding that history tells the story of how small numbers of individuals in all ages across time hold to the feudal beliefs of enslaving others exercising their lust for power as the ultimate design for mankind. This slavery does not have to be overt with people in chains. This word would conjure ideas of what many of us founders fought against from the beginning of our heritage in the early 1600s, which included economic, cultural, and religious slavery. Yet, with that in mind, this applies in a modern sense to what de Tocqueville wrote would happen to the United States. I will review this more fully during the modern discussion of this letter. Here is an introduction to what he said, beginning with, quote, I had remarked during my stay in the United States that a democratic state of society, similar to that of the Americans, might offer singular facilities for the establishment of despotism. And I perceived upon my return to Europe how much use had already been made by most of our rulers of the notions, the sentiments, and the wants engendered by this same social condition for the purpose of extending the circle of their power. This led me to think that the nations of Christendom would perhaps eventually undergo some sort of oppression like that which hung over several of the nations of the ancient world. He continues, But it would seem that if despotism were to be established amongst the democratic nations of our days, it might assume a different character. It would be more extensive and more mild. It would degrade men without tormenting them. I do not question that in an age of instruction and equality like our own, uh, sovereigns might more easily succeed in collecting all political power into their own hands, and might interfere more habitually and decidedly within the circles of private interest than any of the sovereigns of antiquity could ever do. But this same principle of equality which facilitates despotism tempers its rigor. Well, we have seen how the manners of society become more humane and gentle in proportion as men become more equal and alike. When no member of the community has much power or much wealth, tyranny is, as it were, without opportunities in a field of action." End quote. More terrible, as de Tocqueville wrote, is that the majority of the citizenry is willing to accept the cloak of slavery for security by clamoring in your modern times for the god of environmentalism and the endless economy of growth over the truths of liberty. Doing so by relinquishing your sovereign rights of self-governance over to guardian administrators. My good friend Dr. Franklin once said that they who can give up essential liberty of, to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Now, I present you the original article I wrote signed as Candidus with some modernization for your understanding. As published in the Boston Gazette, October 14, 1771. Messieurs Edis and Gilles, quote, Ambition saw that a morally reprehensible Rome could bear a master, nor did it have virtue to be free, end quote. You see, 
I believe that no people ever yet groaned under the heavy yoke of slavery, but when they deserved it. This may be called a severe expression of disapproval upon far by the greatest part of the nations in the world who are involved in the misery of servitude. But however they may be thought by some to deserve sympathetic words, the harsh criticism is just. Zwinglius, one of the first reformers of his friendly admonition to the Republic of the Switzers, seriously speaks much about his countrymen's throwing off the yoke. He says that they who lie under oppression deserve what they suffer and a great more, and he bids them perish with their oppressors. The truth is, all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they should morally do. Is it possible that millions could be enslaved by a few? Which is a notorious fact if all possessed the independent spirit of Brutus, who to his immortal honor expelled the proud tyrant of Rome and his royal and rebellious race. If therefore a people will not be free, if they have not virtue enough to maintain their liberty against the presumptuous invader, they deserve no pity and are to be treated with contempt and ignominy, meaning disgrace. Had not Caesar seen that Rome was ready to be morally reprehensible, he would not have dared to make himself the master of that once brave people. He was indeed, as the great writer observed, a smooth and subtle tyrant who led them gently into slavery, and on his brow or daring vice deluding virtue smiled. By pretending to be the people's greatest friend, he gained the ascendancy over them by beguiling arts, meaning deception, hypocrisy, and flattery, which are even more fatal than the sword. He obtained that supreme power which his ambitious soul had long thirsted for. The people were finally prevailed upon to consent to their own ruin by the force of persuasion, or rather by controlling arts and tricks always made use of by men who have ambitious views, they enacted their lex regia, whereby the will and pleasure of the prince had the force of law, much like your presidential executive orders. His minions, that being Caesar's, had taken it infinite pains to paint their imaginations the godlike virtues of Caesar. They first persuaded the citizens to believe that he was a deity, and then to sacrifice to him those rights and liberties which their ancestors had for so long maintained with unexampled bravery and with blood and treasure. By this act they fixed a precedent fatal to all posterity. The Roman people afterwards, influenced no doubt by this harmful example, renewed, meaning voted on it, to his successors, not at the end of every ten years, but for life. They transferred all their rights and power, their individual authority, to Charles the Great, also known as Charlemagne. Thus, they voluntarily and deserving public disgrace surrendered their own liberty and exchanged a free constitution for a tyranny. It is not my design at present to form the comparison between the state of the country now and that of the Roman Empire in those drag times or between the disposition of Caesar and that of the present administration. The comparison, I confess, would not in all parts hold good. The tyrant of Rome, to do him justice, had learning, courage, and great abilities. It behooves us, however, to awake and avert to the danger we are in. The tragedy of American freedom, it is to be feared, is nearly completed. A tyranny seems to be at every door. It is to little purpose, then, to go about coolly to rehearse the gradual steps that have been taken, the means that have been used, and the instruments employed, 
to encompass the ruin of the public liberty. We know them, and we detest them. But what will it avail if we have not the courage and resolution to prevent the completion of their system? Our enemies would have us willingly lie down on the bed of sloth and security and persuade ourselves that there's no danger. They are daily administering the opiate with multitude of strategies, techniques, and delusions. And I am sorry to observe that the gilded, sweet-tasting, corrupted pill is so powerfully attractive to some who call themselves the Friends of Liberty. But there is no danger when the very foundations of our civil constitution tremble, when the attempt was first made to disturb the cornerstone of the fabric, we were universally and justly alarmed. And when can we be cool spectators? When we see it already removed from its place? With what resentment and indignation did we first receive the intelligence of a design to make us pay tribute to others, especially other governments? Not to natural enemies, but infinitely more humiliating to fellow Americans. And yet, with unparalleled insolence, we are told to be quiet. When we see that the very money which is torn from us by intolerable regulations and taxes is made use of to still further oppress us, to feed and pamper a set of infamous wretches who swarm like locusts of Egypt, and some of them expect to revel in wealth and behave in the unrestrained way of the spoils of our country. Is it a time for us to sleep when our free government is essentially changed and a new one is forming upon quite different system? A government without the least dependence upon the people a government under the absolute control of a minister of state upon whose sovereign dictates and executive orders is to depend not only the time when and the place where the legislative assembly shall sit, but whether it shall sit at all. And if it is allowed to meet, it shall be liable immediately to be thrown out of existence if any one point it fails in obedience to his arbitrary mandates. Have we not already seen specimens of what we are expect to see under such a government and to endure? In the instructions which Mr. Hutchinson, or for you moderns, your progressive politicians, has received, and which has been publicly avowed and declared will be through regulations obeyed by one legislator's refuse agreement to a tax bill, like your new national health care. And unless the commissioners of customs, the Congress itself, and other favorites like unions are exempted, and if these may be freed from taxes by the order of the legislature or administrator, may not all his tools and employees do menial, meaningless work, or any others who are subservient to his designs, expect the same tolerance to exemption? By another, he being the national administrator, forbids to allow the assembly to any contrarian citizen activist, but agrees to assembly to those whose election and actions he has given his consent, which is in effect to put it out of our power to take the necessary and legal steps for the redress of those grievances which we suffer by the manipulations and schemes of bureaucrats and politicians as well as by their minions here. What difference is there between the present condition of this state, which in course will be the deplorable condition of all America and that of Rome under the law mentioned? The difference is only this, that they being the Romans gave their formal consent to the change, which we have not yet done, but you moderns 
have by electing guardians, not statesmen. But let us be upon our guard against even a negative news article submission. For agreeable to the sentiments of a celebrated writer who thoroughly understood his subject, if we are voluntarily silent as the conspirators would have us to be, it will be considered an approval of the change. A quote from this learned writer. By the fundamental laws of England, the two houses of parliament in concert with the king exercise the legislative power. But if these two houses should be so infatuated as to resolve to suppress their powers and invest the king with the full and absolute government, certainly the nation would not allow it." Quote. And if a minister shall usurp the supreme and absolute government of America and set up his instructions as laws in the states, and their governors shall be so weak or so wicked as for the sake of keeping their positions to be made the instruments in putting them in action, who will presume to say that the people have not a right or that it is not their indispensable duty to their God and their country by all rational means in their power to resist them? I'll read you a patriot poem. Be firm, my friends, not let unmanly sloth twine round your heart in dissoluble chains. Ne'er yet by force was freedom overcome, unless corruption first dejects the pride and guardian vigor of the freeborn soul. All crude attempts of violence are vain. Determined, hold your independence, for that once destroyed, unfounded freedom is a morning dream. I say, the liberties of our country, the freedom of our civil constitution are worth defending at all hazards. It is our duty to defend them against all attacks, external or internal. We have received these liberties as a fair inheritance from our worthy ancestors. They purchased them for us with toil and danger and expense of treasure and blood and transmitted them to us with care and diligence. It will bring an everlasting mark of infamy on the present generation, enlightened as it is, if we should suffer them to be wrested from us by the violence without a struggle. Or be cheated out of them by the artifices of false and designing men. Of the latter, we are in most danger at the present. Let us therefore be aware of it. Let us contemplate our forefathers and posterity and resolve to maintain the rights given to us from the former for the sake of the latter. Instead of sitting down satisfied with the efforts we have already made, which is the wishes of our enemies, the necessity of the times more than ever calls for our utmost circumspection, deliberation, fortitude, and perseverance. Let us remember that if we suffer tamely a lawless attack upon our liberty, we encourage it and involve others in our doom. It is a very serious consideration which should deeply impress our minds that millions yet unborn may be the miserable shares in the event. Signed, Candidus. Modern comments and applications. My fears are great, and that again, the general citizenry of your modern age will not receive the benefits of the true founding wisdom that uncompromised history can instruct. As written in this 1771 article, Alex de Tocqueville wrote in 1831 in chapter 6 of his book 2, a discussion regarding the tyranny that occurred during the Roman times. More so, de Tocqueville was concerned that America and other Christian democracies 
would fall to a despotism that was not ever recognized before. He described it in such a manner that you, in the modern United States, might finally be able to grasp what is happening by my elaborating what he said from my opening comments. And I quote, But it would seem that if despotism were to be established amongst the democratic nations of our days, it might assume a different character. It would be more extensive and more mild. It would degrade men without tormenting them. I do not question that in an age of instruction and equality like our own, sovereigns might more easily succeed in collecting all political power into their own hands and might interfere more habitually and decidedly within the circle of private interest than any sovereign in of antiquity could ever do. But this same principle of equality, which facilitates despotism, tempers its rigor. We have seen how manners of society become more humane and gentle in proportion as men become more equal and alike. When no member of the community has much power or much wealth, tyranny is, as it were, without opportunities in a field of action. As all fortunes are scanty, the passions of men are naturally circumscribed, their imaginations limited, their pleasures simple. This universal moderation moderates the sovereign himself and checks within certain limits the inordinate extent of his desires. Independently of these reasons drawn from the nature of the state of society itself, when I consider the petty passions of our contemporaries, the mildness of their manners, the extent of their education, the purity of their religion, the gentleness of their morality, their regular and industrious habits, and the restraint which they almost all observe in their vices no less than in their virtues, I have no fear that they will meet with tyrants in their rulers, but rather guardians. I think, then, that the species of oppression by which democratic nations are menaced is unlike anything which ever before existed in the world. I am trying myself to choose an expression which will accurately convey the whole of the idea. I have formed of it in vain. The old words, despotism and tyranny are inappropriate. The thing itself is new, and since I cannot name it, I must attempt to define it." End quote. As was mentioned in the third paragraph of my article, that our enemies would willingly have us lie down on a bed of sloth and security, Having you received the daily administering the opiate with multiplied strategies, techniques, and decisions via the modern media leads then to what the Tocqueville describes what the citizens will see, petty and paltry pleasures with which they glut their lives, and that they will live apart from their neighbors and children such that he exists but in himself and for himself alone. Above that segregated citizenry, de Tocqueville views the future, your present, as seeing that in the race of men stands an immense and tutelary, meaning guardian, patron, or protector of power, which takes upon itself alone to secure the citizens' gratifications and to watch over their fate, that power is absolute, minute, regular, provident, and mild. It would be like the authority of a parent if, like that authority, its object was to prepare men for manhood, but it seeks, on the contrary, to keep them in perpetual childhood. It is well content that the people should rejoice provided they think of nothing but rejoicing. For their happiness, such a government willingly labors, but it chooses to be the sole agent and the only arbiter of that happiness, 
It provides for their security, foresees and supplies their necessities, facilitates their pleasures, manages their principal concerns, directs their industry, regulates and at the sale and purchasing of property, and subdivides their inheritance. What remains? That to spare them all the care of thinking and all the trouble of living. Your present situation is that of not understanding liberty to the extent that de Tocqueville describes your condition with state and federal agency regulations and burdens at every level manipulating you. He additionally said, after having thus successfully taken each member of the community in its powerful grasp and fashioned them at will, the supreme power that extends its arms over the whole community. It covers the surface of society with a network of small, complicated rules, minute and uniform, through which the most original minds and the most energetic characters cannot penetrate to rise above the crowd. The will of man is not shattered, but softened, bent, guided. Men are seldom forced by it to act, but they are constantly restrained from acting. Such a power does not destroy, but it prevents existence. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, weakens, extinguishes, and stupefies, meaning unable to think clearly, you, a people, till each nation is reduced to be nothing better than a flock of timid and industrious animals, of which the government is the shepherd. You now call these citizens that de Tocqueville described as sheeple. Unlike in the time of 1771 when the king appointed the governor, your governors and politicians who wield immense power and authority are elected. To this concern, much was written in the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers, but I would again direct you to de Tocqueville, who visited America in 1831, as he continues writing almost prophetically of your present condition, saying, Our contemporaries are constantly excited by two conflicting passions. They want to be led, and they wish to remain free as they cannot destroy either one or the other of these contrary propensities, they strive to satisfy them both at once. They devise a sole guardian and all-powerful form of government, but elected by the people. They combine the principles of centralized and that of popular sovereignty. This gives them respite. They console themselves for being in a guardianship by the reflection that everyone has chosen their own guardians. Every man allows himself to be put in the straps which support a child learning to walk. Because he sees that it is not a person or a class of persons, but the people at large that holds the end of the chain. By this system, the people shake off their state of dependence just long enough to select their masters and then relapse into it again. A great many persons at the present day are quite content with this sort of compromise between administrative despotism and the sovereignty of the people. And they think that they have done enough for the protection of individual freedom when they have surrendered it to the power of the federal government at large. He continues, of all the forms which democratic despotism could assume, the latter would assuredly be the worst. When the sovereign is elective or narrowly watched by a legislature which is really elective and independent, the oppression which he exercises over individuals is sometimes greater, but it is always less degrading because every man, when he is oppressed and disarmed, may still imagine that while 
he yields obedience, it is to himself he yields it, and that it is to one of his own inclinations that all the rest give way. In like manner, I can understand that when the sovereign represents the nation and is dependent upon the people, the rights and the power of which every citizen is deprived, not only serve the head of the state, but the state itself. And that private person derives some return from the sacrifices of their independence, which they've made to the public. And subjugation in minor affairs breaks out every day and is felt by the whole community indiscriminately. It does not drive men to resistance, but it crosses them at every turn till they are led to surrender and exercise of their will. Lastly, it is in vain to summon a people which has been rendered so dependent on the central power. To choose from time to time the representatives of that power, this rare and brief exercise of their free choice, their vote, however important it may be, will not prevent them from gradually losing the faculties of thinking, feeling, and acting for themselves, and thus gradually falling below the level of humanity. Now, my friends, the conclusion that can be applied from de Tocqueville's commentary as it complements my article is that for you citizens at this present time and for future generations must always have a clear and truthful perspective of liberty above all else. I can only finish with restating the end of the final paragraph in my original article saying, instead of sitting down satisfied with the efforts we have already made, which is the wishes of our enemies, the necessity of the times, more than ever, calls for our utmost circumspection, deliberation, fortitude, and perseverance. Let us remember that if we suffer tamely a lawless attack upon our liberty, we encourage it and invoke others in our doom. It is a very serious consideration which should deeply impress our minds that millions yet unborn may be the miserable shares in the event. You, each individual, is responsible for self-governance as a sovereign citizen and must again, as we did in my time, be active in your own security and political determination by engaging in the various meetings of local government agencies and holding accountable the elected through going to their offices, contacting them by every means possible, and encouraging them to hold to the moral and virtuous actions demanded by their oaths of office. If they will not listen, then recall them and vote them out. Now is a time for action and eternal vigilance. I thank you.